was also one of the four members, four Republican members, who voted um, with Democrats to condemn the president's tweets. There are two others who are still in Congress, Congressman Upton, uh, for example, who's sort of on the retirement watch right now. So you could see others uh, uh, decide to make that same decision. Let's be clear, though. I do think that at least through 2020, this is the Republican Party of Donald mm -hmm. Trump. And I think that what you saw in these retirements was less sort of a reshaping of the Republican Party and more a message that, hey, non-Trumpers, non you can go, and that's okay. And I think that that's what is driving some of this. I mean, in 2018, the number of, after 2018, the number of women in the Republican conference was cut in half, yes. and now two of the 13, of those 13 remaining are leaving. have announced their leaving. When you step back, Dan, from a historical perspective, you've been in the reporting trenches, the president's framing this as a reaction to what's happening on Capitol Hill, not a racist endeavor. Others, Democrats hi, Cynthia. Hi, Debbie. President Trump said this is about white identity politics. What's happening here? Well, I, I mean, the public has made a judgment on this, and, and slightly more than half of the public thinks that the president of the United States is racist. Um, and he has done things that feed that. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Catherine. Oh, Friday. Oh, thank you. I'm bad with this. Come here. 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 Yeah, she gets her booty off tomorrow. Tomorrow. Hi, Patricia. Rhonda Badonna's in the elevator. I love how you know her, her nicknames. Sabrina has not earned a proper nickname. Uh, Shirley, how did you send the screenshots? I, I reposted most of the ones I got so if you sent them by messenger to the website I have not seen them yet although I suspect Sabrina or uh, Brittany re-posted re, um, them Sabrina the teenage wit no Sabrina come here come on Sabrina come on come here give me some love give me love come here Come on, come on. Come here, come here. Hold on. Okay, come here. Um, in the refrigerator. There are people inside his White House, then in his campaign, now in his White House, uh, who are pushing the president to do just that, who truly believe that you have to be tougher against China. That is in and of Such, uh, No, um, the sutures will fall out on their own. They said to, to take the bandage off tomorrow, and if it looks funky, bring her in. But otherwise... Don't put the bandage back on. It's, it seems too soon to me. 
Seems too soon to take the bandage off. Pacific partnership, a deal he helped push uh, with President Obama. Now moving a little bit closer to the labor. Yeah, it, it, the bandage says Democrats. take off tomorrow, it but speaks to the ideological just seems too soon. Within the party, it's you know reflected obviously in issues like health care, but also on trade. Um, they're clearly at different points uh, within you know the, the on the spectrum. Um, and at some point, I guess voters have to decide which side they like better and what they believe in. No, they didn't say rewrap it. I, I watched the video again. Where would she take this country? Well, she, she rolled out a new trade policy, another one of her plans shortly before the debate, and essentially is looking for uh, tough penalties against China, but as, as Trump has done, uh, but really wants to fold in things like environmental protections and worker protections in future trade plans. So along the lines of what uh, progressives have wanted from trade policy, remember, she was one of the original critics of, of uh, Obama's uh, TPP plan, which, which Biden, too, walked back. So I think it's a sign that not just in the Republican Party, but in the Democratic Party, too, it's becoming more protectionist, more focused on workers. Dan, I don't want to forget one of the big pieces of news today. The president signed a budget deal that extends the debt limit into 2021, raises spending limits by hundreds of billions on Capitol Hill. Any other year, a blockbuster deal like this would be huge headline. It kind of fades into the background in the Trump era. But have we seen a Republican Party that's walking away from deficit reduction? Yes, um, and uh, you could see it in two places. You could see it when they passed the tax bill, um, because that blew up the deficit. Uh, and you could see it in, you know, in, in allowing this to go through. Uh, and the president, who runs the party now, being a champion of it. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think politicians in both parties have come to the conclusion uh, that deficits ultimately don't matter politically to voters. Um, people talk about the sky will fall if we do this. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the hundreds of billions of dollars that are paid constantly in debt service uh, and the impact that that will ultimately have. Uh, but that's always somewhere out in the future. Uh, and it's always easier to give people more money, whether it's through tax cuts or spending, uh, than to take really tough action on the deficit. It's a bipartisan deal. The Speaker and the President... Came Michelle, she was chewing it a little bit, you can see. possible agreement this fall on the no, Sabrina. I think it's going to be very difficult. Um, I think that bacon so belly, that's right. She has bacon belly. Want to watch Bill Maher? Do you want to watch Bill Maher? Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, is going to have to make some serious decisions about incentives for bringing that to a vote and how much she's going to be behind it. I will say for this budget deal, the President, I'm told, made some calls, tried to get some Republicans on board. That's about it. Wasn't that? It was a little bit of a tempted. We are going after his. Us? Trying to bite the most respected name in news? Well, then I need them up. Let's bag this elephant. Let's bone this turkey. You have an interesting family. Watching you people melt down is the most satisfying activity. We aim to please. But coming up to the finishing line, no get rolling. And now, the HBO original series, Real Time with Bill Maher. And she look getting bad and neat. Getting bad and neat. Twice in their life. Start the clock. 
There's bacon, but bacon belly. Don't have to tell me. Yeah, bacon belly. Did you do that? Pork belly was bacon. No, I did not know that. Bacon belly, my bacon belly. Look at that. So how long has it been gone? It doesn't seem that long. No. Usually it takes a lot longer. When I call hump month. No, I took it. We were off last month in July. I took some time off to come back strong. I feel as fresh and invigorated as Robert Mueller in a hearing. <laughs> it's terrible. But uh, good news, Trump left Washington, D.C. the weekend today. Uh, see, he can reduce crime in a black city. <laughs> <laughs> You groaned a little first because you heard black and crime before hearing what the meaning was. <laughs> Don't fucking do that, okay? <laughs> I fucking hate it. But even for him, he had a racist D month. <laughs> You'd have to chill out. A racist? Today he told Dora the Explorer to go back to the city of gold. I, I, I... Of course, he told four congresswomen to go back to the country you came from, and uh, Melania said, how come I never get that option? <laughs> Did you see, <laughs> yesterday he said, I am the least racist person in the world. <laughs> in the whole way. You're not even the least racist person at the Cracker Barrel. What the world? <laughs> well... Today, his ass-kissing lackey that he had appointed for a director of national intelligence, kind of an important job, uh, he withdrew. Even Republicans were like, this guy's still stupid. Yeah. They, found out, they found out he was an idiot, a partisan hack, and a compulsive liar. So he's staying in Congress where he belongs, okay? <laughs> but it's amazing. Trump doesn't vet anyone. It's the bureaucratic version of not wearing a condom. <laughs> Why bother when you can just pull out? <laughs> you keep thinking. <laughs> but hey, good news. We got a budget deal. Not really good news. It raises the deficit hundreds of billions of dollars on top of the trillions we've already run up on the card. But don't worry. It's okay when Republicans do it. It's like eating when the refrigerator door is open. <laughs> Those calories don't count if the... But you're probably still excited about the debates this week. You watch the debates, I'm sure, that the Democratic candidates... Democratic candidates went after the president hard. Unfortunately, the president was Obama. Uh... <laughs> the debates because that happened yeah the guy with the 97 percent approval rating among the democrats his shit is not woke enough now <laughs> yeah trump saw that he called putin he said i got this one <laughs> uh no they were they were those debates were lively it was a chance for viewers diana's to watching 20 different it's versions weird. of america uh that was just from kamala harris hi diana and of course, Biden being the front runner, he got lit up by everybody. Harris and Inslee and Booker and Castro and Gillibrand, they all hit him. And you know, is this helpful? I mean, Americans don't follow politics that closely. I mean, half the country tunes in and goes, why is everybody yelling at Bob Barker? You know, at the end, I mean, Joe is getting on in years a little. At the end, when the candidates oh, all God. try to, you know, get people to contribute to their that. campaign, uh, Joe invited people to visit his phone number. Is, is that true? I don't have a joke for that, and I don't need one. Years. Good night, Tabby. Sex. His safe word is speak up. <laughs> look, 
The singer of the night was uh, Cory Booker. Did you see that when he said to Joe, he said, you're dipping into the Kool-Aid and you don't even know what flavor it is. I don't know what that means, but today Kamala Harris just made it her health care plan. All right, we've got a great show. We have Jennifer Brown. Oh, we've got Carl. Bob Sexton, and I'll be here a little bit. Got no any of it. He is the Democratic Congressman representing New York's 8th District and the Chairman of the House Democratic Caucus. My old job, Hakeem Jeffries. Oh, It's a big job. It's a big job, I guess. Okay. So, first of all, as one of the few Democrats who's not running for president, uh, you were able to watch the debates, I guess, in a relaxed atmosphere. What was your reaction? Well, I thought that um, the American people did get an opportunity to see a variety of different candidates, you know, reflect the dreams, the hopes, the aspirations of the American people with different ideas, different perspectives. I think that's a good thing. I do think that um, we need to see more moving forward about the economic anxiety that the American people are experiencing. Because we can't simply accept the narrative that when you look at the numbers, things are well for the middle class and those who aspire to be part of it, because that's not the case. We don't have an unemployment challenge, but we have an underemployment challenge. We have a wage stagnation challenge. We have a college affordability challenge. We have a retirement insecurity challenge. And I think moving forward as we head into the next set of debates, drilling down on that deep-seated economic anxiety in a more precise way will serve but, I mean. I feel, I feel like you're more of a left-center Democrat. That's correct. You're like in the Obama school. You know, you were a corporate lawyer. Yeah. Which some people hold against you. They do. They used to think that was the American dream, become a lawyer, doctor, lawyer, my son the doctor. Um, did you think the people on the stage were playing more to the audience than the audience who's going to come to the voting booth? Well, I think we have to resist the temptation to play to the hard left. Now, the House Democratic Caucus, just like the country on the Democratic side, is very diverse. You've got moderates, you have centrists, you have pragmatic progressives, and you have people in the hard left. I think the Democratic primary electorate is going to be reflective of that as well. It's going to be ideologically diverse. And I think resisting the temptation to do what is going to cause you to get attention on Twitter as opposed to what may actually cause the electorate to go out and vote for you right. uh, is something that should happen. you got to stand up to Twitter, don't you think? Yeah. I feel like that's the key to the election. Uh, stand up to Twitter. <laughs> don't read that shit. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, Bill, Bill, de, Bill de Blasio, <laughs> thank you. Bill de Blasio, uh, was attacking somebody at some point, uh, I think Kamala, and he said uh, that she does not want to restructure society. Should we want to restructure society? Is that the job of politicians? We certainly want to improve society. Well, I think we need to improve society, and there are issues that we need to address to make sure that the American middle class dream sustains itself moving forward. But yeah, everyone loves Susie. You know, I think as it relates to the well, mayor, you don't like Susie? You know, our mayor back at home in New York City, there's some issues that he needs to address back at home. I think he can actually Susie! start by firing Daniel Pantaleo, the officer who killed Eric Garner. So um, I'm curious where you are on impeachment because we've seen interesting movement on that. I thought after the Mueller testimony uh, that it was kind of a dead issue, but now they say actually for the first time we have a majority of the Democratic caucus, which is I guess over 109 people because you're 218? Yeah, about 118. Okay. Um, who want impeachment. Where are you on that? I saw you question Mueller. Yeah. Well, I've been of the view that you know, we have to follow the facts on the House Judiciary Committee, apply the law. Don't we have the facts? Isn't that what the report was? Well, the report was a set of facts, and we have to continue to illuminate that to the American people. But there are a whole host of other things that haven't been fully brought to light. The money laundering, uh, the interactions. In but he's going to be gone by then. I mean, we don't have enough. I, I feel like, you know, with impeachment, we're like in the friend zone. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we should have closed the deal a long time ago. Yeah. And... The fact that it's gone on this long, we're just not that attractive anymore. 
Yeah. Well, actually, when you looked at polling in the aftermath of the Mueller hearing, what's been interesting is that support for impeachment actually increased among Republicans. I think it jumped from about 9% to 17%. That suggests that a lot of the American people haven't really been following the facts that have been laid out. But as we continue to hold hearings, and I think Jerry Nadler is going to do a great job, obstruction of justice hearings, abuse of power hearings, culture of corruption hearings, as we continue to fight it out uh, in court to get fact witnesses and to get documents, we'll see where we are when we come back in September and all the Democrats. Well, why isn't anyone talking about <clears throat> moving forward, <clears throat> excuse me, getting rid of that memo that says a president can't be indicted? It's just a memo. This bugs me a lot. They could write another memo that says, it's not a law. It's not in the Constitution. It's not anything. And and when you guys, you all say no one's above the law, bull. The president is above the law. Can you ignore a subpoena? Do you have executive privilege? Can you pardon yourself? Can you say, I can't be indicted because of the job I have? No. That is that not above the law? Well, you're making a good case for getting rid of the memo. Uh, but I actually think... And part of the Constitution. Yeah, well, there's legislation that I support. Uh, that would suggest that we need to go in a different direction in terms of Justice Department policy. The Constitution and the framers were very clear. Basically, impeachment is a political remedy for the House to deal with a president who's out of control and above the law, along with the Senate removing that president. That's mm -hmm. one potential lane. I think Bob Mueller's testimony was also very clear that while a president cannot be indicted according to his reading of the Constitution and that memo, while in office, the president can certainly be indicted once removed, which, by the way... <laughs> well, I don't care about that. Yeah. That's the too late. Well, okay. okay that, in December that's, of 20... No, that's not as yeah. satisfying. That's your congressman for a person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So... Marianne Williamson is on the show here tonight. She was in the debate, and she called for 200 to 500 billion dollars in reparations. Yeah. What do you think about that? What What about that issue? Is it a realistic issue? I mean, I don't think any right-thinking person thinks there's not justification for it. But where's the, as a practical Obama kind of guy, centrist left? Yeah. What's your view on that? Well. You know, the House Judiciary Committee has legislation, H.R. 40, which is supported by the Congressional Black Caucus, supported by Speaker Pelosi, supported by Chairman Jerry Nadler, that would create, for the first time in American history, a commission to actually study the issue, the legacy of slavery, the implications and the devastation that it has wrought for African Americans in the country, and then make recommendations as to how you repair the damage. I think that's an appropriate place to start. We're still studying it. We're still studying it, but still listen. Still studying everything. We have we have 400 years actually to the month the first Africans were brought to right, this 16, country. 19, right. August of 1619. It seems like the least that we can do is pass this legislation, study the issue, and finally figure out how to repair the damage. But well, what if it says? <laughs> what, what if it says? I'm just guessing. African Americans got a terrible deal in this country. Yeah. And they should get some money. Then what? Well, I think, listen, <laughs> whatever case is made uh, for reparations, and reparations can involve a variety of different things, then that's important. It wouldn't be uncommon in American history. Obviously, there were reparations right. that were paid to those victims of Japanese internment, sure. as an example. Uh, and slavery was the original sin here in the United States of America. Well, well and Indian genocide. And I'll leave that out. And Indian genocide, of course. So, final question. Uh, I keep saying, when, <laughs> and now I see Trump is actually quoting me, not by name. He calls me a third-rate comedian. <laughs> and he said, uh, a quite a respected comedian. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a third-rate respected comedian yeah. who says if he loses, he's not leaving. What do you think? Well, I think we have to defeat him decisively. And if we defeat him decisively, bye -bye. they'll have no choice but to leave. Hey, Mario. <laughs> really?